Welcome to Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Are you coping with the rain up there in London? I haven't got any today and mostly didn't have any yesterday. It started about four o'clock in the afternoon, um, but didn't go, but it finished within a couple of hours. So I quite like summer rain. I know it's weird, but I like what it does to my I like what it does to my garden. Oh, it's very lush down here as well. Yeah, it's very tropical. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in fact, as part of my preparations to move, as you'll hear in a minute, I had the gardeners in on Monday morning for, for two hours because my front garden, which is spectacularly beautiful in terms of the size and shape and colours of the I forget what you call evergreens, I think they're called, and they're bushes, you know, anyway, but um, I forget what you call things that aren't trees or deciduous. No, things in the middle, shrubs, shrubs, that's it. Um, they are very beautiful. They're very beautiful. And when my freeholder put in the planning application to excavate the basement, one of the things we would have lost was the front garden. And the, and the front garden is, is very beautiful. It provides a screen, a, a sort of um, security screen to the lady whose flat is in the front and overlooks the road. So she doesn't have net curtains. She has half a height of gorgeous coloured variegated shrubs. and. Yeah. It, it, the rain had caused it to grow so much from both sides. There's a little path in the middle that goes to my front gate. I remember. It, uh, well, we couldn't see my front gate. The man from Ocado couldn't find it. Um, you, could, <laughs> you couldn't walk through the bushes. You couldn't walk through the bushes with all the rain not joining your clothes on both sides. And so they had to hack me a path through there, which was tragic but necessary. And they've done the back garden as well, which I'm looking at now, which is lovely. But all I can see is greenery and lush trees and roses and good things from the rain really yeah yeah well I'm fighting the ongoing battle against slugs we oh my god last <laughs> night when I shut the window I had to bat a, a slug off the inside of it oh disgusting they are so I know. I've I got know, they are. we had it occasioned a trip to be in queue because um Nelson came around last week and planted some plants and I didn't actually realise, but before we'd even put them in, the slugs had had the flowers off them. I know, I know. And then, and then I, so I'm, I'm chatting to the person at the uh, garden centre because they were there. And I said, look, you know, what can I do? He said, well, slug pellets is the only thing, really. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know about chemicals. I said, I've been putting the coffee grinds on. He says, honestly, none of that works. It's slug pellets is the only thing that saves your plants. So I bought some and I thought they were poison, but they're not actually not. They're bait. So instead of... Um, killing the slugs it just gives them something to eat rather than your flowers so oh, i've also resorted to a big vase of beer in the middle mm. of the flower bed because apparently they, 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 like like that. they go in and drown yes they do they like beer yeah well, i'm not going to be able to get rid of them so again again nelson is required <laughs> so but at least yeah. gives an opportunity you know gives me a chance to get him around at least in, you know for half an hour to an hour because he's a very busy lad nowadays because summer holidays have started from college so what I what I don't know, I mean, I can understand why you wouldn't want to get rid of it. What I don't know is if you've got a beer mug full of dead slugs in your garden, where do you pour the contents of that? That's disgusting, isn't it? I know, I know. I, I can't even. I haven't even got that far, Judy. <laughs> no, I know that is grim. I mean, I knew about the beer thing. Anyway, I was sitting in this chair last night after the rain and talking to a colleague at about I don't know eight or nine on Skype, and I suddenly saw this huge conference of snail slugs. That's you know snails, I think probably literally it, within a. Within a one path, uh, pay, what do you call them, paving slab, yeah. so I don't know, 15 inches square, 20 inches square perhaps, I don't know, maybe 15 of them all having a conference. <laughs> what do they discuss, I wonder? I have no idea. Oh, grim, grim. No, no, you're right. There, there is something really quite unpleasant about a slimy slug and a snail, isn't there? You know, I don't want to kill anything, but at the end of the day, it's my flowers or them. Yeah. And, and I can't keep buying flowers for their delectation. 
I tell you what, Nicola, I really like it when things come down to ch two choices, my flowers or them. It's so easy when you've got when you've got a lot of choices. Should I do this or this or this? It's quite hard. But when it comes right down to my flowers or them, it's really easy, isn't it? Yes, I know. It's a, a slippery slope, that route, though, isn't it? Oh, don't Talk say slippery slope. <laughs> Talking of uh, delectation, the Gusto experiment continues and is oh, a right, yes. success. Oh, good. Absolutely loving it. We haven't had a dud one yet. I can't tell you how delicious the meals are. It's teaching us a bit about portion size because I'm usually a little bit over generous on my dishing up. And I just love the way that you don't have to think about it. It's given, it's put, as I tweeted to them today, hashtag, it's put the thrill back into dinner time. Well, I, after your effusive uh, mention of it last week, I went online and discovered that I can't have it because I'm one, not two. Uh, and that was the same problem with the other one that everybody else is having. Oh. Hello, fresh. I can't have that one either because I'm only one, not two. Um, oh. But never mind. That's OK. Well, you know, really what it is, is, is just, you know, we, we, we've dug out the old cookery books as well, because, you know, obviously at least you can actually have gusto every every day if you order two, two twice a week. But um you can only order four, four at a time because I think that's how how long it keeps fresh. <clears throat> so um, so I think, but I think if you went on, you know, got your cookery books out, got organised, and had a good store cupboard of stuff, then you'd be fine. But uh, it really does. It's so nice to have to not have to think about it, to not then go around the shop once you feel thought about it, to then cook it. You know, it's just it's just so nice to be able to stop work and cook something delicious early and, and enjoy yourself. It's, it's great. Well, that thing about not having to make decisions was why I dated a chef for a decade, because, you know, dinner is just on the table. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, quite often when we went out to restaurants, I just let him choose me because I'm just so bored with making decisions by the end of a business day, to be honest That's with you. true. Yeah, absolutely true. And this week I've availed myself of the Naked Wine offer which came with Gusto, and it was such a stonking bargain. Now, I think we're going to talk about this in our client challenge of the week. It was such unbelievable value. Save 80 quid on 12 bottles of wine. And so you're getting a, a bottle of wine that would normally cost you 10 or 11 quid for about three to four pounds in this first batch. So I'll see what the offer is ongoing. But uh, the other thing is it's going to make me, in the way, same way that Gusto is, expanding our recipe re repertoire, and you get to keep the cards, um, I want to try lots of different wines that I wouldn't normally have chosen because I would have just bought, you know, bog standard. And again, so and again, they get de they get delivered, don't they? Oh, today it's coming. Today. I know music to my ears. You see, I don't drink, but I had a naked wine voucher about two or three years ago. And guess who I gave it to? I can't remember. Steve. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bless him. I know. You're only allowed one, I think. So, uh, so I'm not, when I get them now from Amazon, I put them in the bin. Yeah, no, it's a shame, isn't it? But yeah, no, it's, it's been a good week. And the other thing is um, Sarah's made me move, because um, uh, we had some of Steve's furniture delivered by his stepdad. And it's been sitting in the dining room because I haven't been able to face doing anything with it. But we, Sarah went on a decluttering mission last yesterday and we hoiked one of the wardrobes upstairs and put all our, we had a rather untidy sauce suitcase cupboard corner and we've now got a very tidy suitcase um, and other things like that corner. And it's it's much better. So you get a little thrill, a frisson of pleasure every time I walk up the stairs. I must say, I think a wardrobe is the ugliest thing on God's earth. Yeah, it's not great, but. You know. No, they're not appealing. Yeah. I just have an open rack, which I think is prettier. I can see all my frocks easier. <laughs> see, I, I, visually, that would be too messy for me. I like it all tidy. Oh, no, no, it's pretty. You can have it colour coded or you can have it in seasons. Um it's, I don't like. I think they're, they're ugly, aren't they? They're they're just made of MDF. They're horrid. Yeah, well, uh, those IKEA ones are. Old, but I've I've actually got built-in cupboards that are all painted. Oh in. no, no, they're all right. I agree. Built-in and painted, they're all right. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, that's uh, what, anything else about your week? Was yes, it? yes, I've got quite a lot about my week. Okay. Um, my sale is back on pronto. Um, oh. actually, the day this recording goes out, the eighth of July, might be the day we're exchanging contracts. On Monday, I got an email from the Gazumper saying she'd got the bridging finance and she wants to come around and see me about completion. She couldn't come on Monday. She said she'd come yesterday, Tuesday at 4.30. Half past seven, no sign of her. So I thought, well, I'll put my lamb chops on, put the supper on. And of course, the doorbell goes and she comes with her little boy who was very sweet and wanted to play on the floor with crayons. Um, we've come up with a rather good deal. I've taught, In fact, what I think will happen was we'll, we'll go for an early exchange of contracts using the proof of funds as the bridging finance offer letter but actually we'll go for a delayed completion so that she's then got say two or three months to get a mortgage and we'll have the bridging funds in the background in case she can't get a mortgage but if I 
delay completion for two or three months, she will save more than 20,000 in bridging finance fees and she will pay my mortgage for the period of time between uh, exchange and completion. So oh. I, I, could be, I could be liberated to go to France as early as next week. Wow. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Mitzi's been in her new home for eight days. She's coming to terms with it. I've got two items still to come in the post, and I've got the shredder, the oven cleaner, and my nephew and, the, and his furniture requirements to sort out. And I've got car stuff, because when you take the car to Europe, you need a green card still, believe it or not, and to extend the AA cover in case you break down. And the one thing I really am struggling with is getting through to Vodafone, where I have a mini SIM in my iPad, and... T-Mobile, where I have my mobile phone, which I don't really use my mobile phone and I barely use the SIM in my iPad, but will do more perhaps when traveling for maps and things to get them, you know, on roaming plans that are affordable. What they want to do at the moment is charge me three pounds a day. Well, they can dream on. About yeah. That one. yeah, I suppose it will be your biggest expense, won't it? Getting on. Not necessarily. Well, I don't really know. When I get to the house, I'm on Wi-Fi. Oh, OK. Right. And I don't use my phone at all, and I don't. I barely do texting, and I've got a Skype number or Skype for phone calls. Um, but I'm used to on my iPad whenever I leave the house, uh, being able to be online in the car and things like that. So, and you know, we use map reading apps, Google Maps, don't we, and things like that. Well, you that's, that's, mustn't use that. You must get um, a sat nav. It eats your data allowance. No, darling, I, I don't need a sat nav. Um, it's only on the journey. I can, I can, I hate sat navs. I'm, I'm the daughter of a Royal Marine. I do map reading. I've got a map. I've got a proper map. I won't need it because it's really the most simplest journey on the yeah, earth. But you okay. want. You want these as a backup in case anything happens. That's so yeah. the, the way the way the AA do it, for instance, if the car breaks down, you go onto the AA app to report where you are, and it knows where you are because it knows where your location is, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, but the problem is I've got a habit now from 2011 of whenever I'm out of the house with my iPad, I'm still online, and it costs £15 pounds a month. As it transpires, I'm paying for a much bigger package than I need. I was paying for two gigabytes, and I've never exceeded two megabytes. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, but uh, when they transferred me to a different department, they managed to cut me off. You know, you have to you actually when you phone Vodafone or T-Mobile or any mobile company, you have to press the button marked. I'm thinking of leaving you. Otherwise, nobody will speak to you. I know it's it's infuriating, isn't it? They either want to sell you something new or you have to say you're leaving to get any attention. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to do that today. Yeah. OK. So so do you think there is a, an affordable roaming package? somewhere uh and no i don't think there is but if if i can get the sim card down to actually paying for my usage and then pay three pounds on any day where i choose to use it so for instance if you were on route and you wanted to use it to pay three pounds a day is fine yeah but that's that's one day when you're traveling three yeah quid. Well, worth it do you know what i mean so that then you've got the choice is it do i want to use the data today for three pounds yes or no do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, okay. And you definitely need a phone just in case, don't you? Well, well, I have a phone, but I never use it. Yeah. And even if you break down, you won't use it because you use the AA app, but then you'd be roaming then, do you see what I mean? So, okay. uh, yeah, I don't know. So it anyway. could, be next, could be next week then. So you're looking at the week after next, do you think? Well, possibly. I don't know at the moment. Of course, if we do the exchange of contracts, not completion, there's no requirement for me to move. Now, she wants it to be on the 8th of July because she's going three weeks holiday to Jamaica. So, But she can leave. She can sign forms before she goes and her solicitor can do it in her absence. But there'll be no rush for me to move. I can move in my own time. My nephew doesn't want his furniture until the 15th. So I might be looking at another couple of weeks here. I think. Okay. I've just realised another thing, of course, of whether it's St. Martin or... Normandy you just buy a local sim card when you get to France don't you yeah yeah buying it in the country is definitely the way forward but yeah. you need to make sure your phone and your sim is unlocked no they, they both are yeah yeah cool all right yeah because I, well, I bought my sim separately from my ipad okay. and uh, I've been unlocked on my mobile because it's so retro for decades yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't want it locked or anything <laughs> right So what's fueled your fire this week then? Um, well, I've had um, um, difficult times last week with um, disappointments of awful customer service, the whole thing where we couldn't get Mitzi in the box and somebody that said they would come and didn't and some, the cleaner not doing what she was. I had a really, really, really difficult week last week. And what's fueled my fire 
is that my clients have very been very kind and understanding and supportive to me, which of course isn't their job. No. That's my that's my job to be um, kind and understanding and supportive to them. And so that was a really nice thing to feel <clears throat> part of my own, excuse me, <clears throat> part of my own community. Uh, a special mention to Alice the artist in this section too, who gave me some uh, very wise advice on Monday. So it was it, it, the, the tables have been turned this week, and and it was lovely to know that there was that kindness and support there. Yeah, lovely. Um, what fueled my fire this week was um, simple structures. I've, I've, we're going to talk in the challenge about the main one, but I've been going back through um, Dan Norris's content machine book, and the thing that he, things that he gave away with that were the resources that he gave away were um, really nice, simple documents that you could actually just fill in. And it's it's astonishing, you know. Don't underestimate if you're a coach or or a consultant out there. Don't underestimate how much your clients appreciate not having to do the grunt work in creating their own forms to fill in you know so so for example I you know I printed off um some of the stuff from that is is he he brainstormed a load of topics that you could cover in a year if you're in the business coaching market for example um or you know business success market and he just put a picture of his whiteboard up and you know that's all the brainstorming done for you there and then the next one is the um, first 20 topics framework so that's again where you you know you could take some of his stuff and put it in in there and he's he's actually worked through it as an example so um, in in the boxes that I've printed out there's a pale gray version of what he thought you know for WP curve so the content multiplier framework you've got his stuff in pale gray that you can just write straight over which I thought was really cool content creation style guide what else have I got here um, I've got a, this is the, the most important thing, 10-minute content strategy, page one. And it basically asks you 20 questions about, you know, what your website's going to be for and about when it's done. And then you've got the key, key relationships. And literally, it's just a, a grid, you know, on a thing. But he's started putting his own examples in. And I think that by creating, you know, saving me hours of time with a spreadsheet, because I'm a bit obsessive compulsive with spreadsheets, and I can get a bit sucked into them. So by saving me plenty of time with having to do my own spreadsheets and then giving examples of what he was thinking in each box, I think it makes it easier to fill it in and create a content marketing strategy. That's what I'm trying to do, create content marketing strategy for the year. So a, a bit like Gusto, so that you eat better by not having to think about it. Mm -hmm. It's a similar kind of thing. But so the yeah. simple structures and uh, what's fueled my fire and, and don't underestimate them if, if you're supplying stuff to clients. They, they value them. Right, should we get stuck into our client challenge of the week then? Yeah, we're going to talk about what we're both going to begin working on this afternoon, which is a, a sales letter for our Evergreen Summit recordings. And um, you've sent me a few um, resources, two, two, two at least, I think, di different ways to do it. The first one you've sent me is the only one I've looked at at all, which is five elements of a compelling offer, which are that it should be believable, urgent targeted personal and undeniable value believable urgent targeted personal i think we can do that one and then you've got another one haven't you you said yeah i've got um a two things that come together i've been watching a lot of um kevin rogers this last week uh i was he was one of the people who, who spoke last year at james Franco's super fast business conference that i wasn't actually at and for some reason it was the one video that i hadn't watched from that because james puts all the videos of all the speakers in you know the the membership and and he's got a company called copy chief and he's an ex stand up comic and he was talking about and one thing i really enjoyed the video it's hilariously funny he's just got the comic timing thing down pat as you could imagine but he was saying that every um the 60 second sales hook is what he calls it. And he started to get very successful when he started talking about headline creation in terms of writing a joke. And a joke's got four elements to it. One is identity. Who are you? Um, where did you come from? What are you doing now? The second one is struggle. 
which is, you know, what have you had to over- overcome to get here? Um, and the next one is discovery, which is, you know, when you discovered something that made a difference. And the fourth one in a joke is surprise. And that's where the laughter comes from, because the, mm. the comic says something you weren't expecting. Yeah. And and but it's storytelling essentially, and in in marketing, it's you, you replace the surprise with with the result. So yeah. um, I'm Nicola Cairncross. I spent years and years as an unsuccessful failed entrepreneur from the age of eight. Um, every business I started died, um, and there were a lot of them until I discovered um, how to create paid traffic. You know, where affordable paid traffic, where I could get enough eyeballs on my offers. Now I run a six figure facebook ads agency and i can teach you how to do the same so that's okay. the result so that's that's the basic okay. format of a joke apparently whereas yeah. if i said until i discovered the secrets of how to skydive or something you know it, it would be and he gives a, a load of examples there's a, the, a thing called the letterman show where um new up-and-coming stand-up com- comics go on and they get something like three minutes to do their thing and if you look at the Letterman show and watch these stand-up comics, they've literally got your attention within the first 30 seconds. And they, if they've made you laugh with the surprise yeah. element of the joke, they've, they've won. Yeah. And so, I, th- you know, he, Kevin's idea is that that's a brilliant way to write a headline. There's also a very good resource. Let me just um, find it online, which is called um, 41 Examples of Great Headlines. Now, I had it just yesterday. And I can do you think we might uh, we're both going to work on this separately and together this afternoon. And and I think it's going to take us more than one session. Do you think we might end up with two sales letters and test them? Oh, we can certainly do that. Yes, absolutely. That would be good. Because uh, some of what you just said is going to be quite difficult for me to write because it's a little bit formulaic. I know a sales letter should be, but I can't always write formulaic. No, but what you can- I, I like I like a formula, but I want to be able to adapt it to my own the words I would use and the do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely, and and I know what you mean because sometimes when I've written a sales letter, it's just flowed, and that's probably yeah. because you're a writer, the how you want to write. But what the structure that that we're going to talk about gives you is it gives you a way of going through your flow writing and making. Yes, there's no. I'm happy with the structure. I'm happy with the structure. That last bit made my body feel a bit odd oh okay like like I'm Judith Morgan I did this this and this and the, 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 the. that would that would that wouldn't sit well in my sales letter I don't think unless I can find a way to make that work but I'm interested in this 41 classic copywriting headline templates because I think the headline is vital isn't it it is and it's really vital when you write blog posts as well it's it's 90 percent of your yeah and I don't take enough time over the headline of my blog posts actually yeah. apparently you should write the post first and then um put the headline in afterwards yeah I do, so, I do that I do that but I, I don't like share it's Harris yeah. Amy Dot com and we're going to put a link in the in the podcast uh, now hang on a minute because i cut your, your cursor's over it so i can't see okay harrison with amy. two uh, two r's and one s yeah amy harrison amy.com hang on let me write that down harrison I'm dropping in the chat judith i'm dropping That'd it be good harrison amy.com i've shut skype now harrison amy.com forward slash 41 can you read it to me? It's very small. 41 hyphen classic hyphen. Classic copywriting headline templates with hyphens in between. Hyphens in between each word. But we'll put a link in the show notes for episode 86. Yeah, classic That's copywriting podcast headline topic. templates, is it? Yeah, classic classic yeah. copywriting headline templates. Yeah. Okay, good. And uh, and basically, it's, it's, basic, it's just, it, you know, you just substitute your words for yeah these headlines and it's it's a yeah. it's a nice simple resource because i tell you what happens to me judith when i think about i mean i have written the occasional sales thing that's worked really well and the money gym just flows yes but yes I was, well, I was working to one of guy levine's structures in those days i was going to say that probably wasn't a sales letter nicola it was probably just an excited an excited offering do you know what i mean by that which is if we're excited about because for instance i don't think our evergreen summit recordings solve a problem um okay they provide inspiration they're a towards not an away from yeah very much so yes yeah that's right you've got exactly you've got have got to be solving a problem or getting someone yeah Yeah. and so so what happens to me recently and especially recently I haven't even written a sales letter for my Facebook ads course which I really should have done but so what happens to me is I get overwhelmed by the thought of it I don't actually do it or when I do do it I'm worried I'm leaving something essential out 
So when I was listening to Kevin at the weekend and he came up with, he came out with this four by six ninja copy technique. Um, yeah. Four, it's four essential facts they need to know before they can buy from you. Yeah. Six reasons why they need to buy now. Okay. I just thought, what a lovely, simple structure just to start with. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Now, you see, now I'll tell you why, because that gives us room to personalise it. Well, no, to use our own language. It doesn't say you've got to be horribly cheesy. No, absolutely not. Yeah. It doesn't mention cheese anywhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so should we run through the four essentials and the six reasons so that everyone yes, can see? Before you do, I just wanted to say one thing, which is um, the fact that we're both going to have a go at it this afternoon, and I'm sure it will take us a couple of weeks, and the fact that then we can, you can adapt it to your Facebook ad scores, and I need to adapt it to Small Business Big Magic, because I paid somebody else to do that, and it's not in my own words, and I think that's always been a failing. I think we could enjoy this between the two of us over the next month or so, not just for our combined product, but for our separate offerings. Yeah, and we could report back on results. I mean, if you remember, I do, I, you probably don't, I wrote a fantastic sales letter for our event at the Globe, which I mentioned the other day and you'd forgotten about. But we had um, quite a lot of women come. It was, our, it was our Women Talk Money. Yes, Women Talk Money at the Globe. It was in 2007-ish. 2007 and they paid us a big daily fee, 247, 347 included lunch at the Globe, glamorous venue overlooking the thing. I can remember that one as one of my triumphs. I do like a good sales letter as long as I can do it in my own voice. Yeah, and, and Kevin says that um, long form sales copy, why, you know, everyone goes on about long sales letters, everyone hates them, but yeah. it, on every test I've ever done, they outperform any other method of selling. Okay. And actually, a, a webinar is just a long-form sales letter turned sideways and put to video. Yeah. When you're writing a webinar, it's still got, you know, you should still be following a format yes. and, and yes. templates. And I actually have a Brett McFall um, template for writing for writing a webinar. And basically what you're doing when you're writing a webinar is you're just covering all these things, these essential well, I, I I'll tell you who gave me a formula for that, and I actually went on the webinar for it, it was John Richardson, who we interviewed on our summit, because he's, he not only sells from webinars spectacularly well, but he teaches people how to sell from webinars. So yeah. I might even send you that link. Now, let's go through these four essentials. OK, so the, the first of all, after you've got your headline, which has got their attention, um, for the four essential things that people need to know before they can buy from you are, one, what is it? And okay, uh, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But again... People tend to get a bit over verbose on that, and they yeah. also tend to focus on, as you said last week, the features, not the benefits. Yeah. So this this is a formula here for writing the what what is it section. Okay. It's a, it's a bracket product description that helps bracket customer avatar do bracket benefit action by bracket unique product feature. Okay, so, so that's good. You can have a benefit and a feature in there. Yes. So, yes. so basically, it's a an evergreen video training course that helps yep. coaches, consultants, authors, and experts yep. get lots of affordable traffic by learning how to do Facebook ads like a pro. Okay. So that's my yeah for my Facebook ads course. Yes. Now that's good. It's longish, but it's okay. And and it's also um, you could say it in thirty seconds in in an elevator. So it's essentially an yeah. elevator speech. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Essential number two: they need to know before they can buy. For who are you? Now this is where you do the I'm Nicola Cairncross, a failed fashion designer turned ninja Facebook ads expert. Yeah. And that's again, you know, you've got to grab their attention. You've got to make it um, interesting. You want that. You want yeah. them to say, "Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more." Yeah. Essential number three is, why can't I live without this? Now, the key thing to remember about this is your customer is on a pain spectrum somewhere from mildly uncomfortable occasionally through yep. to at crisis point. And oh, oh, I just thought uh, our, our people are trapped in their offices. Yes, they want their, So the pain spectrum. They want more freedom. Yeah, they're trapped. Yeah. They're trapped as you and I are sometimes at times. Yeah, absolutely. In, 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 in work, trapped in work, trapped at the laptop, trapped at the computer, addicted to um, work, social media, you know. Yeah. OK. So so most people, if they if they like their job and like their life, they're not even mildly uncomfortable. 
Most people, though, don't like their job on quite a few occasions, so they're mildly uncomfortable. Some people get to the point where they go and sit and cry in the toilets like I used to. That's pretty near crisis point. (laughs) And most people, if you imagine it, a line with mildly uncomfortable on the left and crisis on the right, most people are in the middle. And what you need to do is reveal something that they may not know about themselves or about their lives or about their situation that they don't know yet So, for example, if you think they're mildly uncomfortable and you want to get them into the middle, because you sell from the middle to the crisis end. Yes, of course. So you do very, and I'm I'm being very careful with what I say here because we used to call it poking the pain. Yeah. I've never been very comfortable with that expression. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to reveal something. So, for example, 95% of small businesses fail in the first year and a further 95% have failed in the next three years. That's something that a new entrepreneur may not know, and it immediately moves them from, I'm mildly uncomfortable about starting my own business to now I'm seriously worried if I don't get some good mentoring, I might be one of those statistics. So if you reveal something they may not know, um, statistics help here, especially if you can back them up. So, you know, always quote your source, uh, put one of those little asterisks and and, down the bottom. Essential number four, they need to know. Their first question is, when will I expect results? Now, this could be either you know am I going to get more time am I going to get more money am I going to know how to do something like bring my golf pile down over three or whatever it's called Um, or and then if you can add outcome orientated feelings so how will they what outcome will they get from working with you and how will they feel about it because okay so already already this one this one four essentials and six reasons is better than the other one yeah, well, the other one was sort of an overview, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Uh, th- there's a difference between writing a sales letter and having a compelling offer, and you yeah. can't actually write a sales letter without a compelling offer. Because yeah. if you can write a sales letter, you're blue in the face. But if there's no compelling offer in there, nobody's yeah. going to buy anything. Yeah, fair enough. I see. So we'll come back to that. We'll we'll need to merge them, as you said. Okay, you were just getting to the six reasons. Yes. Okay, the six reasons um, why people should buy now. Yeah. Because obviously, every time someone, he put it really well, he said, every time I read a sales letter, I'm looking for a reason why I don't need to get my wallet out. He yeah. said, and I will seize on any reason you give me that I don't have to get my wallet out. And I can think, oh, thank God for that and go back to Facebook or whatever. So mm-hmm. your six reasons why people should buy now are reason number one, show me the value. So, for yeah. example, in my Facebook ads, if you wanted to hire me to do your Facebook ads for you, it would cost blah, 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 and you'd have to pay blah, click costs. But well, if that you... works for our 18 speakers. There's an awful lot of expensive expertise in there. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. Um, it would also cost a lot of money in terms of if you got it wrong, if you moved abroad and you were working you know, online and you got it wrong, then you know you you would make mistakes and it would cost you dearly. But if you, I, don't, I also think um, the the listener alone couldn't get access to some of those people we got access to. Well, that's very true too. Yeah, because only, mm. only with the fact that I've bought some of their high ticket training courses yeah. has got yeah. people to say yes. So, yeah, so it can either be a pain thing or it can be an access thing or it. But you've got to show people the value, otherwise yeah, they yeah. Can't buy. For example. Yeah. Naked wine showed me the value. There is no way, even if I went to my local wine store and spent an afternoon there talking to the chap behind the counter, that I would be able to get um, 12 bottles of wine for three to four pounds each rather than 10 to 12 pounds each. You know, the okay, so reason num- yeah, I get that. Reason number one's about value. I'm, I'm, I'm because we're on the first of six reasons. I'm nudging you along a bit because we okay. could be stuck here. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Reason yeah. number two, proof. Yeah. Testimonials, yeah. drill down. Right. So when you're asking for testimonials, um, a good way to do it is to write the testimonial for the person, send it to them, and ask them to approve it. That okay. people find it very difficult to write testimonials. If you're talking to someone on telephone and and write, you know, doing their testimonial for them, drill down to the moment when they realize something had changed as a result of working with you and how they felt about that. People buy on emotion and justify yeah. it. So. Yeah. Now, we've got some testimonials in our Facebook group from our summit weekend, I think. Yeah, yeah that would be great. We, we need to. And some of our friends, we could go to them to amplify it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so good, good um, testimonials are specific outcomes in financial terms, traffic numbers. Yeah. You know, yeah, that works better for that works better for our separate one, like your Facebook thing and my my small business big magic yeah, thing. Yeah, but yeah. You know, feelings are good. Reason number three, yeah. guarantee. Now the best person to listen to is Dan Kennedy on guarantees. Be bold, reverse the risk. Uh, longer guarantees are better. 
well, it, with a digital product, it doesn't cost you anything to give a 100% guarantee, return guarantee, does it? So it's a 100% satisfaction guarantee, is that you Well, on, on ours, yes, on our, on our Evergreen product, um, if they didn't think it lived up to our claims, within how long would you give them? Three months? Oh, 30 Month? days. No, you can't do 30 months. days. That's too long. 30, 30 days. days. Okay, so if they received it, listened to it, didn't think it lived up to our claims in a sales letter, 100% return guarantee, yes? Yeah, well, the only snag with that is that people could buy it, listen to it all, and then ask for the guarantee. But you've got to be bold and realise that only a tiny number of people are going to do that. I, I agree. I also don't think it costs us anything with a digital product if people ask for their money back. I was thinking about this with my Facebook ads management service. It's very. I can't guarantee. I can't guarantee no. results no. Though, because it no. all, it all depends on their sales letters and their process. What I can guarantee is good quality traffic and that we'll, we'll treat their money as if it was our own. Um, I'm just having another thought about our guarantee as well. It means that we can't pay the affiliates for 30 days. Yes, good point. Yes, that's that's another thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, reason number four is um, bonuses. Re make them relevant. Keep them to one to two maximum, ideally just one, and sell the bon in, in a smaller way, sell the bonus as hard using this process as you're selling the main product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like a bonus because it adds value enormously. Yeah. And, and actually, for me, in number four relates to number one. Show me the value. I think the bonus reinforces the value often, doesn't it? It does. And, and if you can make it relevant so that by using the bonus, they'll get more, more joy, satisfaction, outcome results from the main product, <laughs> then it's even better, isn't it? OK, so well, here's a thought. Is the evergreen digital product a bonus that could help us sell our respective offerings? Uh, possibly. It doesn't. I don't think it helps you sell your Facebook ads, but it might help me. It might be my bonus, my small business, big magic joiners. Oh, well, it would sell, help me sell my Facebook ads course for sure. Well, there you go. Yeah. Then, then it works both ways there. Yeah. We, what we've got to do is find bonuses that we can give them that are relevant and valuable for the, for our joint thing. Yeah. We'll think about that in, after the show. Yeah, okay. Um, keep, you know, so reason number five, order, why should they order now? And and let's make it really easy. He made some really good points in this. It, don't be sheepish in asking for the order. Make sure there's a big fat buy button. I'm terrible for this. <laughs> I actually look at my sales pages afterwards sometimes and think, well, what were they supposed to do? And I quite like a lot of, 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 of big fat buttons, actually, because when I read a sales letter, I know whether I want it in the first 10 to 20 percent and I want my button up there. Yeah, absolutely. You have three sales buttons, have one at the yeah. top after the summary, have one in the middle. Yeah. Where just yeah. That's called the trial close. And then yes. have one at the end. The, also, the, other yeah, the, the, the people who read all the way to the end, the mechanics, you know, the Lord accumulations and the mechanics, they read yeah. all the way to the end yeah. um, looking for typos and reasons not to buy and they want their button down the bottom. Yes, and but then there are people. Um, the other thing is, uh, try an emotional. Uh, when, when you're when you're doing webinars as well, try a trial close after you've done an emotional bit, and then yeah. and then try the second close after you've done the technical bit because the technical okay. people won't buy until they've seen the techie stuff, and the emotional yeah. people will buy straight after they've seen the emotional. If there's no tech in ours, no, ours is all emotion, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And the, this was an important point. So many people don't go through their own order process. Go through your own order process and buy. And if you've got a high yeah. ticket item, make it a yeah. pound and go through it and buy. Because you have to make – watching Kim with her iPad the other week made me really realize that – it's not immediately obvious to a lot of people what to do next. So uh, he made the point at each stage, tell them what's coming next. Tell them what will happen after they click that button. Tell them what will happen after they've closed that window. You know, make sure there's no surprises and it all works. Okay. Cool. Reason number six, scarcity. Make Right at the end, make sure that they know that there's a reason to buy now. Make it real. Stick to it. It can be time, numbers, or price. So, for example, early bird discount um which ends here and make sure it does end there then you've got okay there's only this is only going to be available for the next week or it's only going to be available for the next 10 people 50 people 100 people whatever and that's mm. pretty much it and if you cover all those things with a compelling offer headline a de really good headline you can split test the thing is judith the thing to us what would it be sorry go back to that last reason what will it be for our evergreen product I don't know yet. Don't know yet. We've put a time issue with it because that's the point of Evergreen. Price, 
we could do we could do for the I mean, we could do numbers and price we could check we could try both not you know for the next hundred people there's a special yeah. Yeah. or if you buy within 24 hours of landing on this page which we can tell can't we uh, with infusionsoft there would be te something techy yeah 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 so I, i've seen veronica i've seen veronica pullen do that when you go if you didn't buy it the first time you were there when you go back next day it's not it's not the bargain price it was in the offer yeah and and that's the other thing is um you could have now th th this is where we we really we we we're, we're actually going to sell the recordings and then we're going to make a one-time offer of the pro group. Um, yeah, we are. Upsell. Yeah. Because yeah, if you don't if you don't make an upsell offer when people have just bought, they're they're something like seventy five percent more likely to to take you up on your on your next offer. Yeah. If the next yeah. offer is a better version, um, a good thirty percent of people should take you up on it. And and these are you know statistics that have been proven through the industry. So just out of interest. You should look to get a one to three percent conversion on your sales letter, and it, you know, so for example, if you send a thousand people there, between one and three percent should buy, and if you don't achieve that, then your sales letter needs work. But by writing a sales letter following this structure, you've got a good first draft, and that's all you need to do is get a good first draft because then you can use a tool like optimizely.com or visual website optimizer.com. You don't have to create lots of versions of your sales letter. You just create the first version and then use an online tool to split test okay. different elements. Okay. So opt, just just get the first one up there and start mm. eyeballs. Now, the other thing is don't put your sales letter up there and get disappointed when no one buys. Make sure that actually some there are visitors to your page. So make sure you've got some way of seeing, you know, even if it's Google Analytics, that there are eyeballs looking at your offer. And if there's no eyeballs looking at your offer, that's when you need to come and buy my Facebook ads course. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't sell to nobody and you can't sell to not enough people. You have, you know, 10 visitors to your page and no sales is not a disappointment. It's an, it's an obvious outcome because if you're only going to sell between one and 3% of the people who see your sales page, you need a hundred people before you've even got a chance of making a sale. Mm. So, People, I just see this all the time. Or people just get so disappointed they haven't sold any, and it, actually they've, they've had no traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So first draft up. See what you do. We'll, we're going to do a, a version each, and we'll split yeah. between the two. Yeah. Well, well or, or we might just compare one to the other and combine them. We could do that, and that would be our first draft, our first starter. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you'll get some bits better than me. I'll get some bits better than you, and we'll we'll merge it to make our first best combined effort. In it's an interesting point you're raising there because um, some bits will be better. Who in whose opinion? That's the thing. Well, I, I, let's let's see, shall we? Yeah. Let's see. I think that it might be. I think we're both quite generous, and if you get better wordage, well, there's the point. Actually, what does what we think is it irrelevant? Is it only what the visitor thinks? It is only what the visitor thinks, which is why yeah. I wanted to just raise that point there. It's not about what yeah. we think. We don't know. Yeah. What we might do is split test two versions and yeah. see which one sells more. And okay. the, other, the other thing is you've got to remember that not all traffic is equal. So if you send oh, a mailing list to your, you know, it's going to buy yeah. your list. Yeah. If yeah. I send my mailing list, it's they might buy more. I don't know. They might buy more from my yeah. thing because of the language. Right. Absolutely. The tone and everything. Yeah, they'll yeah. recognize you and they like you. Exactly. Yeah. So what we would need to do to make this a really fair trial is that we set up two affiliate links so that we're both yeah. sending traffic through for affiliate links so we can see yeah. wh whose traffic converts best on which which sales letter do you mean a separate affiliate link that we only use in connection with the sales letter i mean i've already got an affiliate link you probably haven't have you yeah yeah but what we'd, <laughs> is we'd, we'd make your affiliate link point at um the sales page and then we'd use google analytics to split test two different versions and then I would use my affiliate link and we'd send that to the sales page. And, and so so don't just look at which which sales page wins. Well, I can I can tell you already now, I couldn't give a monkeys who's the winner uh, in terms of whether it's yours or whether it's mine. What I want is for the win to be for us to make the most sales. I totally agree. And I'm not being competitive about it either. I'm just trying to make the point to the listeners that yeah. you've got to bear in mind your traffic. So, for example, when I went to... Um, when I got some clients from the mastermind group in Vegas, they were 100% used to mailing to 
what's called endorsed traffic. It was very warm traffic, other people's traffic had been warmed up, it had been nurtured, and they were sending an endorsed mailing. So that it was a bit of a shock to them when they then started to advertise on Facebook because it was stone cold traffic. It hadn't yeah. been nurtured, it hadn't been warmed up, it didn't know the person that was sending the, you know, yeah. making the offer. And so there was nobody to introduce this person. So so that's that's why you've got to really think about what kind of traffic is going to see your offer and and know what kind of result to expect. Well, interesting. Our, our, our affiliate report already proves that. I don't know if you saw the message I put in the affiliates group, but um, the affiliate report you sent me shows that our speakers who have massive reach got clicks and even opt-ins, but are not a single sale because, of course, they were they were sending people to a place that you and I own that their listeners knew nothing about. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but there was an exception to that, which was which was Amanda, who achieved two sales and and has a small but responsive list. And she hadn't even heard <clears throat> the recordings at that point, but because her list trust her recommendations they bought on trust yeah and mine bought because they knew it was me and they were trying to support me in the podcast you know so it's really interesting that although the speakers did do a, a reasonable job of clicks and opt-ins they didn't achieve a single sale and I, I understand why they do because they were pointing at a third place so the way to do this is either be be connecting with people who yeah is connecting with people who know you already and on the say on the cold traffic front you know, that sales letter's got to do the job that Amanda and I did in our emails to our lists. Yeah. And that's what a good sales page should do. It should it should answer yeah. the problems. Now I didn't actually use an affiliate link at all on any of my promotions. What I was using was Google um, URL shorteners because I wanted to see whose name got the most interest. And yeah. do you know what the most interesting thing about it was? Was it was Michael and right. Kayla. Oh. Uh, yeah, and, and they're the people perhaps that people hadn't heard of. You know, most people. There was one sale under your affiliate link. Yeah, but I, I literally only created my. I tell, I tell you who that was. It was somebody went looking for your affiliate link. Actually, I know who it was, and you know who it was as well. Somebody, I don't know, but the, and actually, you told me I'd made more sales than I had, but actually, you'd used my affiliate link when testing, so I had to reduce those, I had to strip those out of the stats, which is oh, quite funny. Um, yeah, no. So I, well, I literally only created my own affiliate link literally a day before the summit, just because I wanted. Yes, yes. Uh, well, one person bought from it. You'll yeah. be, you'll be pleased to hear. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you look at this, Michael and Kayla got the most click-throughs on. You know the social media marketing. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, James. You know, I, if you sort of look at it proportionally, because not everyone would have clicked through the links. Um, yeah. The blog competition got, and Michael and Kayla got the most number of clicks. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but but Michael and Kayla were relative unknowns on that on on. Yes, so indeed. It indeed. could have been their picture, but I thought Justin and Shona's picture was lovely. So I, it's just you just can't tell, can you? That's no, why you that's have the to point. Test. That's the whole point of this story, isn't it? You can't tell. You can't tell what's going to work, so you have to test. And the good news, yeah. it takes all the emotion out of it by writing two separate sales pages and just sending two different types of traffic to it. Three different types of traffic we can give. Um, if we want to run some Facebook ads, we could give that an affiliate link so that it tracks any Facebook traffic and we can see what cold traffic does versus endorsed traffic in your case. The other thing is I've re realized this from the summit. My list is all about Facebook ads now because that's the only advertising I've been doing really pretty much in the last year is advertising to people who might want to use Facebook ads. So, my so this is off topic for your list. Yeah, it's off topic for the list. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I've been. That's something. That's why I've been looking at creating a content strategy to create a more mixed. Ah, and now that explains why Amanda's list works so well because hers is all of VAs, and the whole point about a VA is that they can work from anywhere in the world. And of course, we had Michelle Dale on as one of our exactly. speakers. Exactly. Yeah. I wonder how many people bought for Michelle's interview. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this has been pretty useful. If, if along with the what we'll do, Judith, is um, I've got this document here now, which I can um, make a copy of and we can give it to our listeners. So if they come to own it, the podcast dot com um, and look for episode 86, all about compelling offers and sales letters. And then we, they can download this little um, sheet that I've drawn up for you and I to work. You'll give me some sort of link for that, will you? I will. Yes. 
And uh, you've already emailed that to me earlier in the week, didn't you? Uh, I That particular thing I did, yes, but I can also drop yes. it in right here. Okay, okay, lovely. Share it with the same people. <laughs> okay, there we go, that's done. Right, good. So that's a client challenge of the week. I think it was quite a useful one, don't you? Yes, it is. I need to go back to your screen so I can see what time it is. Okay, there we go. It... Not yet, you don't. No. <laughs> right. No. No, no, I still can't see your desktop. I need to see your desktop. Oh, okay, fair enough. It's a lovely. So that's how I. That's how I manage the time on these uh, thingies. There we go. There it is, marvelous. Okay, slightly overrun on that. We need to get a wiggle on. A wiggle on, right? Uh, word of the yeah. Book. Yeah, you go first. Storytelling. Because what Kevin made me realise is that everything in marketing is about telling a story. Snapchat yeah, is failing yeah. until they put the 24-hour timeline on so people can not just see people's snaps as they go past but see their whole 24 hours later. And Mark, Matt Duggan's very good at storytelling on Snapchat. Marketing's about storytelling. Sales, making sales is about telling a story. Creating compelling video is about telling a story. And if you can just... You know, Andre Chaperon's Autoresponder Madness is about telling a story in soap opera sequences. And um, it's just if you could just think of marketing in terms of telling a story, getting people to relate to you and then telling the story of how much better they'll be once they've bought your product or service and used it, then you won't go far wrong. Well, I'm going to tell you a great story in who or what's impressed. Uh, and it relates to my word of the week, which is stickability. I'm not going to explain it here. Uh, keep going, keep on keeping on. Stick at something uh, for the results you want. And I will explain more when we get two sections down. Yeah. And uh, we did a, an episode last week's episode. Eighty five is all about perseverance. And I was ed editing it earlier and I was thinking how good the content was on that section. So if you're someone like me who has trouble sticking at things, then you might want to go back and listen to the episode on perseverance because mm -hmm. he actually identified it as a success criteria. Yeah, so he did. I've forgotten. I haven't listened to that one yet. Yes. Okay, so project updates. I don't have anything in this section except I'm going to write my sales letter this afternoon. <laughs> no, and I don't have anything in this section because I've just been immersed in, you know, this sort of stuff. Do it, re revamping nickelcairncross.com, having watched Kevin's sales videos. So, okay, all right, cool. Good. We'll skip as we went rather long in the main section, we'll skip it now. You want to tell me your who or what's impressed? Yeah, because it's only a short one. Game of Thrones, oh. Judith, we're. <laughs> We oh, yeah. finally so you're back. It. You're back. And, and some people on social media have gobbled up all the episodes so far. Well, everyone is, who, who got into it early is they're They're just starting season seven. No, no. Sorry. What I mean is the current season, somebody I follow on Facebook's watched it all already. So she must have some kind of. Can you do that on Netflix or something? You can, you can do it on um, VIP TV and. Oh. Uh, yeah, they're just starting episode, uh, series seven. Sarah and I are on. Series two, uh, episode eight, and we've been binge watching since the weekend, and it's just so good. And what we've realised that not only is it a good story in its own right, but the, the compelling characters within it are constantly telling a story. And if you watch it, I mean, it's you know, it's quite a lot of violence and sex interspersed with some great storytelling, which is why everyone's so enthralled by it. I think amazing, absolutely love it biggest uh, ostensibly the biggest tv program in the world but when i googled what's the biggest tv program in the world i found something else and i've been watching that it's not very good to be honest but there we go what, what's the thing <clears throat> what's the thing you're not watching that's not very good <laughs> well i am watching it but it's not it's i'm surprised um it's called ncis which stands for naval criminal Investigation. oh yeah, yeah, I, watched some of that, yeah. I, I quite i quite like it actually but it's 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 um you know you wouldn't matter if you'd never saw a single episode ever it's not it's not substantial it's not like you know my favorite box sets of all time nowhere near no i don't i'm not so keen on that naval one i, I did um it was a spin-off from cis miami and Crime scene, which is which, and CIS Las Vegas and things like that. They're they're really good. Well, interestingly, this one is quite good. The first series, I mean, it's got it's in its thirteenth season or something, you know. So, funnily enough, the, you know, thirteen years ago, the episode's quite dated, but uh, and you know, the haircuts are weird and the fashions are weird, yeah. and things like that. I do quite enjoy it if there's nothing else on, and frankly, there is nothing else on mainly. Yeah. Now, let me tell you who or what's impressed and tell a good story, Judith. 
Well, I think I'm going to, and I think you're going to like it. You won't like the metier, because I know you're not in the least bit interested, but it's Wimbledon. Uh -huh. And the, the funny thing about Wimbledon is it's five miles down the road from me, and sometimes we have different weather, which always cracks me up. I've always lived within five miles of Wimbledon, and you could be watching them pull on the covers because it's raining in Wimbledon. You'd be looking out your window, and it's sunshine. Anyway, Sharon will like this story. Uh, on Monday, the first, well, first of all, there were, and this is as rare as rocking horse doo-doo, but... You probably don't remember this. When, until the man um, bust the four minute mile, this isn't tennis, this is athletics. Uh, I can't remember when he did it now or what his name was. Bannister. We didn't believe, we didn't believe that's it, Roger Bannister. We didn't believe it was humanly possible. Mm. And as soon as, he, as soon as he'd done it, everybody was doing it. And the same thing about marathon running, you know, 25 years ago, it, you know, six people in the Olympics did it and it practically killed them. And now hundreds of thousands of people do it all the time. Anyway. Because of Andy Murray's success on Monday, the opening day of Wimbledon, there were a lot of Brits in it, including women, and there haven't been any Brits with any hope of doing anything in Wimbledon my entire adult life. Um, but there was a man on Monday called Mr Willis, ranked 772 in the world, mm -hmm. who, whose earnings to date as a professional tennis player in the current tax year were £250. Oh, bless. He beat the man at number 54 in the world, so that's 720 players better than him, on Monday, earning £50,000. Oh, my God. Earlier in the year, he said, I'm going to pull out, I'm no good, it's hopeless. And his girlfriend said, no, you're not. Um, it, you know, he had a relatively new girlfriend, and she said, you know, you're not going to do this. We're going to find a way of you carrying on. And when I saw him interviewed, and his girlfriend was a dentist, so Chris Barry might like she managed to, some equipment at her salon was surgery wasn't working on Monday afternoon, which meant she might as well leave and go to Wimbledon and see him win. She got there just before he won. He's got a nice personality. And when he was interviewed afterwards, he couldn't quite believe it, but he said, it's what I've dreamed of since I was very young. And that's what they all say, of course. But he wasn't the only one. We also fielded a good Brit on Monday against Djokovic, who's number one in the world. And of course, he made short work of him. But our Brit guy really did well. And then yesterday on day two, um, Andy Murray, the Brit, then played another Brit. So there's this handful of British tennis players because Murray's proved it's possible. I suppose you could say Henman proved it was possible, really. But, I mean, the, the gorgeousness of his girlfriend, a new girlfriend, you know, in this year said, no, you're not pulling out, you can have a go, because she believed in him. Well, I don't think because part of, uh, of his success is because, you know, when you have somebody that believes in you. But he's a giant killer, and he, he won, made £50,000 on Monday. Now, snag. You've got to play for Federer next, so oh, that's for, probably probably a short journey. But you don't know. Federer's, you know, not at the peak of his game anymore, so we'll see. But um, no. I thought I thought it was wonderful to watch actually. And he had gorgeous support in the audience, some people who screamed at every point he made and encouraged him, and he loved it. And you know, there's nothing like a Brit doing well at Wimbledon because the audience is so supportive. Yeah, and uh, what a lovely story. I feel quite tearful at the thought of it. I love it. I know, I know. And I, I watched it live, and there's nothing like that, actually. Ranked at seven, imagine that. Imagine being in any field where you are ranked at 772 in the world. Now, you can imagine him going, one second, caller, one second. <laughs> you can imagine him going, I'm, what's his name? Uh, something Willis. Right. I'm bloody blah Willis. I yep. spent 25 years t playing tennis, not very well. And I, I don't dreamed... think he's that old. I don't think I... he's that old. He's probably... oh, right. <laughs> but even so, yes. I, I <laughs> dreamed of playing at Wimbledon. And I, yep. I never thought I could win until I discovered blah de blah de blah. Now yeah. I'm... I've gone from 700th in the world to, to 50 something in the world. And I'm... Um, I made fifty. 000, I went from making two hundred fifty thousand pounds in one year to, to fifty thousand in one match. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to know the secret yeah. of that? I don't think. I don't think he'll go from seven seventy two in to fifty four in one match. But he he beat the man who was um seven who was at number so seven hundred and twenty yeah. odd places above him in the league. And made fifty thousand pounds. I mean, dream come true. He was quite quite faced by it. He couldn't really. He could see during the match that he was going to win, or we could all see that. And I think he could too. But once it was over, I don't think he could quite believe it. Yeah, but but just illustrating that whole sixty second sales with identity, struggle, discovery, result, and yeah. surprise in there as well, which is lovely. 
Yeah, it is. And, and also, I think when they interview sports people and they say, it's what I've dreamed of since I was young, or I always saw myself at the 2012 Olympics, or whatever it is, they're visioning. Yeah. And, they're, and, they're, and their coaches teach them how to do that. And all, they, all the coaches then do is work on the performance to close the gap between the reality and the vision. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. What a lovely episode. There we go. So brilliant. Yeah, so funny mixed old match, actually, wasn't it? Funny mixed old content. Well, well I think it was. I, I hope, and we'd love you to tell us, was it a value to you, listener, lovely listener? So either go to iTunes and give us a review and tell us, or come to the podcast and comment. We don't get any comments on our website, and we would love some. And uh, you can either do that in writing or using our SpeakPipe app. Well, I tell you what, Nicola, and I noticed this on the summit weekend as well. People these days, and we should have done this. If we ever do something like that again, we need to remember this. We we thought we'd be chatting to people on Go to Webinar, and they didn't chat to us there. They chatted to us on the Facebook group because they have that open as well, and it's easier. That's true. Yeah. So come to the Facebook group if you're listening and you want to hang out with a gang of like-minded people who listen to the podcast regularly. Then go to Facebook and just search Own It the podcast, and you'll find the group and the page. Like the page, yeah. join the group, and we'll see you in there. Yeah. Thanks very much. Speak to you later. Okay. Bye. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com. 